All right, welcome back to the, uh, this uh, rest of our morning session. Um, we have a, a, the next speaker, Matt Jacobson, from um, the Air Force Research Labs, and he'll, he's gonna be telling us about their efforts to build this uh, integrative collaborative environment for materials research based on Hub Zero. So welcome to Matt. My name is Matthew Jacobson, and I'm with the Air Force Research Lab. My role there is the technical lead for the development of integrated collaborative material science and engineering systems. We'll get into what that means specifically. Um, and what we're doing is actually for a, a slice of the Air Force Research Lab. Uh, and I'll also describe what that looks like, kind of the organization to provide a sense of scale and scope. Um, which is really exciting for us because there's a lot of opportunity, there's a lot of people to serve, um, and a lot of tools to integrate. There's a lifetime of work available. Uh, what I'd like to do today is um, describe our relationship with the Hub, sort of how it's evolved, uh, in particular because um, myself and, and uh, Dr. Chuck Ward were here last year um, with a different story uh, in terms of our what, how, we, how we were using the hub, uh, where we intended to go with it. It's been a busy year, it's been an exciting year. Uh, we've expanded our team, our development team, uh, four of uh, whom came with me uh, to the, the conference here, uh, and we'll be giving presentations this afternoon. I would encourage you all, if, uh, if you can, to attend those, because they're gonna be describing some of the specifics about the uh, functionality that we've been building into our environment, um, and the hub is a big part of that. And the other thing I'd like to do is I guess advocate for us as a community to share lessons learned and so a lot of this is just kind of a story uh, from our experiences um, there's been some discussion between myself and others on how do we take what we're doing here and make this less of an annual event and more of a continual uh, process of sharing um, suppose it could be a, a hub for all the different hub communities uh, that we set up or something like that uh, because we don't want to be duplicating the work that everybody else is doing. We've seen some really cool tools here today, and I've got notes down to contact a few of you about how specifically to, to acquire those. And uh, we're hopefully going to be able to offer some things back, too, uh, both from a, a, co a code perspective, so some of our libraries may be useful to you, uh, but also from an experiences perspective, uh, and we welcome feedback. So let me kind of step through this. As I said, uh, I'll explain what ICMSE is. Um, and how it really is more of a sort of a global or overarching concept that can be applied to a wider array of subject matters and it's not specific just to material science and engineering. Either introduce or reintroduce ICE. Um, some of you, particularly the, the folks on the Hub team, are familiar with what we're doing, uh, but for those of you that aren't, I'll, I'll step through what that looks like. Uh, and then how the Hub fits into that whole puzzle. And that's, that's a big um, point of, of victory for us uh, that I'd like to discuss kind of where, we're, where we are with the project and where we'd like to go. And then a couple of case studies from a subject matter perspective in terms of how we're using this tool set to enhance the work we've done in our lab. Um, and then finally, sort of again, present a vision for, for where this is going, uh, some of our lessons learned, and then um, continue the discussion with you guys. Because our biggest, one of our biggest goals here is, is collaboration. Before I do that, I'd like to make a few acknowledgements. Uh, first, uh, without um, Chuck Ward, the, uh, this whole effort would, couldn't move forward. We've got excellent top cover and leadership from him and advocacy uh, in the Air Force from him. A couple of the members of that IPT, the integrated uh, process or product team, um, and then the development team that I lead. Great people doing great work. And then finally, the good people at Purdue and specifically the Hub Zero team. Um, you guys have been immensely helpful in getting us to where we are today, so thank you. <clears throat> so as I promised, here's our um, slide on what we mean by ICMSE, and it's, um, it's spelled wrong in the title, don't worry about that. So Integrated Computational Material Science and Engineering, we talk about the, the union of computational tool sets with material science and engineering, and so at a very high level, it's a lot of what we've been seeing here today. 
It's wanting to use computational tools to do analysis, to do uncertainty quantification, to do modeling and simulation. But at a very basic level, it also includes things like tracking the research process. How do you maintain pedigree? How do you maintain provenance uh, in an active and dynamic environment? Um, and that's the challenge. So how do we get there? And before I get into our, how we are addressing that, uh, some of those fundamental questions, um, it, I'd like to describe uh, a little bit more about our organization. Uh, as we mentioned, we're with the Air Force Research Lab, and specifically we're with the, we're with the Materials and Manufacturing Directorate. So you see there at the bottom of the, the slide a wide array of material types that we deal with, and then also, so that's one challenge. It's not one specific material. There are a huge array of material classes that we deal with. But then also the applications, anywhere from bench research to deployed systems. So, and we need to support all that. Uh, and again, maintaining those goals of, of ICMSE. How do we keep full traceability? So we'll take that simply from a materials forensics problem. If there's a failure of a, of a part on a weapon system or a, on an aircraft, let's say, is it possible for us to turn the dial back and see the origins of that specific part and its materials? So at this point, that would be an enormous effort. Uh, but hopefully in the coming years we'll be able to provide tools that allow us to do that uh, fairly easily. A little bit more on scope. Um, our specific lab, we have 700 plus individuals, um, although that expands into several thousand at the total lab level, so there are these other directorates um, that have other areas of focus. But at some point we do mean to serve as well. The, the takeaway from this slide is that, like many of you, you have a lot of people, a lot of equipment. Um, so just from a logistics perspective, there's a lot of complexity. And this is one of the challenges that we faced early on working with the hub and with our system. How do we develop this in such a way that it's dynamic, right? And so that we can take what we've developed for one research team, roll it over into the next, and not be continually going back uh, to square one every time we hit a new problem. So um, to cover, again, to sort of paint a picture here, you see we have discon two, three disconnected um, spaces in our lab that rely on paper lab notebooks, which I'm sure all of you have seen. We have portable hard drives being carried around. There's a lot of disconnection. In addition to that, these are innovative people. And so a lot of times what they'll do is come up with their own solutions. They'll build. Uh, systems, anything from Excel up to a full stack web application that they'll, that they'll put up on their own um, without any sort of central guidance. And so now we have these legacy systems that in, in, in one case, one of the ones we're dealing with now, uh, has 100 million plus records in it for photonics properties of materials. So what do we do with that? Um, and again, one of the big things is that there's a lack of uh, culture and there's a lack of tool sets. So having said that, these are some of the things uh, I'll let you look through that we're going through. And again, part of what I want to do is not suggest that, hey, check out all the cool things we're doing that are unique to us. I, I fully accept that these are objectives uh, for just about any lab um, that's doing work or any, pretty much any organization. How do you get down to a grain and learn enough level in your data to make something meaningful out of it? So we believe that, uh, and I say we believe this because we've had a lot of great feedback from a, a number of uh, organizations, both in government, in industry, in academia, had great feedback on this approach. Our approach is to create this thing that we call the integrated collaborative environment. That is not a um, total union of functionalities. It's not a one-size-fits-all solution. Um, and actually this graphic has changed a little bit since last year. Last year I had the orbs on the outside touching that, that center. Uh, but then it was pointed out to me that they then become attached. They become permanently attached to that. So they're sort of extensions. And that's not the picture that we want to paint. We want to suggest that, for example, in the upper left, you see materials information. Materials information exists, uh, but it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's coupled enough, only enough so that we can see what's in there. But it is an independently managed piece of this infrastructure. And by that, um, it's a federated architecture is what we're pursuing here. And we'll get into some use cases in terms of what that looks like specifically. Um, the, the, again, the key takeaway here is that what we've built is a tailored solution. There are some cost components to it, but largely the, the guts of it are developed by us in-house. Uh, and it does give a theme that I want uh, to emphasize here. 
that the Knights really does represent a, a collaborative partnership between us, the computer science software engineering community, and the materials engineering community. And we think that that is every bit as important as the tools themselves. So now the picture is resolved. We're all happy and connected. Everything is kind of a greenish hue. Um, we get, we've eliminated the use of those uh, paper artifacts. We've put aside our, our uh, removable storage devices, uh, well, because of policy and because of necessity and, and uh, what, what works better for us. Um, but we have a couple things. One, we have tools. This is where we want to get. This is our desired state. Uh, but then that last bullet point is that we see the growth of, of the culture itself. Um, as I said before, we can build all the tools in the world, but without having adoption from the user community, there's not a lot of point in doing it. <clears throat> and we learned some lessons too. And so as far as how do we gather requirements and how do we model the process and sort of iterate through defining and bounding the research process, pulling out data models, developing use cases, it's a fairly lengthy process, and actually Elizabeth Weir is going to be doing a, a discussion this afternoon uh, that, uh, that uh, describes that in, in fairly uh, great detail. How do we arrive at prioritized requirements in such a dynamic research environment? Well, one of the things that we do is that we've found is that we use real requirements. And that may sound kind of like a no-duh, but it's really easy for, for all of us when you start building software to step through notionally what you think it should look like. Uh, but that has a number of serious um, hazards. And a lot of that, it, it's just not a great idea. It disconnects the users, it disconnects you as, as a software developer, and in a lot of cases we found it was very um, confusing. So we, we gave some of these uh, use cases early on to Mike and, and his team. We'd given them to others, and it just doesn't work that well. So we would, we would say it's worth investing the time up front develop solid requirements around actual processes. Uh, having said that, what we look for is sort of two main thrusts, and that's material information and lab information. As we're developing these real requirements, we're taking a specific look at what are the points at which data are gathered and collected, uh, aggregated, distributed, and then what's the total process that surrounds that? It's laboratory information. And we'll, we'll say that's kind of like the workflow is the lifeblood of the research process. Uh, we have a talk this afternoon on our dynamic uh, graphical workflow tool set. Uh, Jason Deese will be giving that. Please check that out. Um, I, we've seen a couple of uh, at least screenshots of other workflow tool sets, and we want to make sure that we're discussing uh, how those are being developed uh, so that we can all take advantage of that. I should say that it, the tools that we're developing, our intent is, to, is for them to be a resource to the community. So we're not, the objective at the end of ICE is for it to be, most of its, its components to be open source and to be independent. So for example, if all you want is the workflow tool set that we've developed in our lab, that, that works, and it works independently of ICE, it works independently of any hub or ICE connection. Um, so again, we want to keep this discussion open. And I've already addressed a couple of the challenges, but certainly in our space, cybersecurity is a big one, and again, it's not exclusive to us, but what we find is the policy is working its way down from all levels of the organization is very constricting. Uh, so early and often, I guess, is our motto as far as uh, getting, trying to get software implemented. Uh, there certainly is a balance between making sure your data are clean and uh, proper and compliant and getting them through in a way that's meaningful. Um, and then the second bullet, is really interesting. I know that in this community, it seems like everybody is moving towards building their own tool sets, relying on open source. Uh, but certainly within the Department of Defense, the uh, tendency is definitely towards commercial tool sets, off the shelf tool sets. And it's nothing against the commercial tool sets, um, but because they have, uh, they have profits that they need to make, then they're not gonna give you the secret sauce. So it's definitely a consideration to look at early if you're considering a tool set is to ask some of those challenging questions of your vendors as early as you can. Uh, because in, in a lot of cases, there's stiff resistance. And that's not saying that the functionality isn't useful. Um, one of the material intelligence systems that we're looking at is very, very powerful. Uh, but it's also very limiting in terms of our ability to get under the hood, pull the data that we need out, 
And a lot of it also depends on what your intent is. Our intent, as I said before, is to build a federated architecture, which means that ICE needs to be aware of all the systems that are connected to it. And that includes something like Grant to MI, which some of you may have heard of. The Grant to MI isn't super willing to expose everything underneath so that ICE can, can have a peek in and, and see that. And I'll step through a couple of use cases to kind of tie those thoughts together. What do I mean by federated, and how does this impact which tool sets that we choose to go with? A little more on the federated concept, as I said before. One of the reasons why this is so important to us, and we've been influenced by discussions here at Hubbub, uh, at, uh, with our interactions with the Research Data Alliance and others, in terms of kind of coming up with this uh, schema. What we intend is that system, you can see these different systems and processes that are connected to what we're calling our common service bus, which is a very robust RESTful API that is independent of any specific application. All the applications in our infrastructure speak to the common service bus. Uh, James Form is going to be giving a, a fairly in-depth technical overview of that this afternoon in terms of how we built out our API to be able to do this and why it's so important from a scale perspective. I don't want to steal too much thunder, but you know, we when you're right, right now we're dealing with perhaps a dozen systems, but that could easily scale into the hundreds. And that, that deals not just with those connect systems that are connected to the common service bus, but it also involves uh, those multiple instances of the common service bus. For example, in our organization, in the Air Force Research Lab, um, this, is, this is growing in popularity, and so we get the word out. Well, somebody in another organization in the Air Force, let's say the Life Cycle Management Center, down the hill from us, hears about this and wants it too. Well, rather than giving them our instance, we're, we're going to deploy an instance to them. Now we have two common service buses with all the attached systems and, and uh, processes they need a common space to talk to each other. And we very much prefer that the two common service buses talk to each other rather than the individual components trying to talk to each other. Again, I'll step through why that's so important. Ultimately, the way we see this is that the common service bus brokers the transactions, right? And so, again, this is important for, I guess, two reasons. One is that in the case of the database that I mentioned earlier, the optical properties, Database, they want to maintain control of that. And I'll be honest, we have no desire to take ownership of 100 million optical properties records for a huge rate of materials. So that's, a, again, that's a cultural thing, it's, as well as a technical thing. We don't want it, we want them to be able to maintain it, right? So that gives them self-governance, and that's a huge win from an adoption perspective. The second thing is that it gives us that traceability, so that any time that a record is created in that optical properties database or ICE needs to talk to it or a, say, a, a visualization tool set needs to pull a data set out of that optical properties database via the common service bus, we know about it. We have timestamps, we have IDs for both people and for objects. And that without it, I, I don't know how it could be done without this sort of approach, if the systems are allowed to talk directly to each other. So specifically, uh, we have two pieces that we'll look at that's the core of our uh, ICE system, which is the, the grant material database, the hub, um, data collection forms, and the API, which we've written in, in the Django uh, framework using Python. Uh, and then finally, a really awesome visualization tool set called Plotly. And for those of you that haven't used it, it is fantastic. They've only been around for uh, I think maybe two years now. They're growing very, very quickly. Um, and they are fully integrated with R, Python, MATLAB, Excel. And the whole idea here is you have communal, communal sharing of both visualizations and data sets. Now that's the big problem, right? When you push out your scatter plot, that's really great. You do any sort of manipulation or validation on that. You need the underlying data, and oftentimes it doesn't, that doesn't come with it. Um, I won't spend a lot of time talking about Plotly, but definitely check it out. Um, it is, it is not a free tool set, uh, but it is very affordable, and it is quickly becoming our go-to, and we're evangelizing it heavily, um, again, for that, to ensure that we're not just pulling the, the visualizations, but also the underlying data. That absolutely gives us that. <clears throat> In addition to those core components, we have what we call our extended components. And again, that's in-house data systems, like I mentioned, that optics uh, database. We have a, a ton of those in our organization. But it also includes components developed by the Navy, the, um, the Army, other uh, components in the DOD, other academic components, etc. We have persistent identification, which I know we've talked a little bit about DOIs and handles. Uh, we, as a uh, 
military installation, we're not able to use DOI handles uh, the way that they are intended, so we build sort of our own persistent identification um, protocol, and, and Kevin Porter will be giving a discussion on that this afternoon. Uh, and that is sort of uh, how we tie all of this together through the API. Uh, and then finally, we have these graphical workflow design tools. As I mentioned before, you'll hear more about that this afternoon. So here's, to focus less on the specific details here, we have a number of components attached. On the left side, we have our four components that I just mentioned. On the right side, we have the extended components. Uh, on the left side, anything that's light shaded blue we have developed, anything that's uh, gray is either a commercial product or something that we're using uh, like the hub. <coughs> and then we have a couple of our other uh, partners here at the Army and the Navy who are looking to connect to that common service bus as well. And of course, under the ARL and NRL logos, we have dozens if not hundreds of systems, uh, as I mentioned before, so we have a serious scale problem. So I'll step through three cases uh, that show why this common service bus approach, to, at least to us, is so important, but then also uh, we would encourage anybody attempting to do this to follow suit. The first case is where we have a persistent identifier that we have control over. So that's basically the case where we have a data model in one of those light blue components that we can change to store that ICE issue persistent identifier. That's ideal, but it's not always realistic. So step one, we use a file ingestion uh, system that we built to upload a CSV file containing data. That file ingestion pro uh, uh, program calls the ICE API and says, I need a PID, here's who I am, here's what I'm trying to create, and here's some metadata about it. Okay, it could be stress strain data for titanium or something like that, right? Those are two pieces of metadata that you'd supply. So the metadata and the location of that PID are registered with ICE so that ICE knows there is a CSV file in our document management system placed there by the file ingestion program. It has to do with titanium and stress strain. So now we have in our, uh, what Kevin named the ontology metaverse. He's a double major in philosophy, so you can't hate him too much. Um, it was a long day for him that day. He just got back from class. We're like, Kevin, what do you want to call this thing? Call it the uh, ontology metaverse. And at the time, we were like, what, whatever, man. You can see it here, so it's stuck. So go, Kevin. And then finally, what ICE does after it has registered the location and the metadata around this file is it gives back the PID. Now, that PID is stored in the data structure of the file ingestion program. Now, case two, which is oftentimes more realistic, is that, for example, Granta is not going to add PID to their database. Right, because that's our own uh, identifier. How do we handle that? Well, so a mature record is created, Young's modulus for aluminum uh, is created in uh, Granta, and then what Granta does is makes a uh, call to the ICE API, to the common service bus, it says, there's a new record that's been created, here's who I am, here's the metadata, and here's my local ID, here's the GUID that I use in Granta. All of those are supplied to ICE. Those go back into uh, the ontology metaverse and our PID registry. Okay, so now how do we, wh why does this matter? So we want to get data back out in a way that's efficient. So search terms are entered in a Google-like or wherever your favorite search engine is, uh, Google-like interface in Love Data Hub. Now the API call is made with those search terms to check the, meta meta uh, the metadata repository for all matches for PIDs, either, either partial or fully matching those search terms. The endpoints are determined as to where those PIDs live. Those endpoints are called, could be a queryable data set, could be a document, could be whatever. It could be a visualization, as long as metadata are attached to it. Um, and then that's returned to the interface uh, for the user to either save, download, save for later, uh, what, what have you. <coughs> and it's worth noting that right now we're just using basically e-value pair assignment of metadata. Um, but we are looking to move into more of an um, ontological approach to this so that, for example, rather than just slapping some key value pairs of metadata on a PID, you're actually instantiating a class of titanium, of aluminum, whatever it is. We're a long way away from that. I have yet to talk to any community really that's, that has uh, made serious progress there other than medicine, and a medicine really has. And, and, if, and if any of you guys have, we welcome that discussion. 
uh, to see which resources you're looking at, because there's a couple of approaches that we're very, very seriously considering as far as developing domain-specific ontologies. Uh, but again, please uh, see me or any one of the, develop of the developers on the team afterwards if you guys have ideas, because we're just getting into that. So how does the hub fit into all this? Well, last year at Hubbub, um, while we were standing up here talking, the development team was back there standing up um, a Django web application. We had uh, used the forms component, which is now deprecated from the hub, to develop a lot of our data collection functionality, develop sort of a, what we call a planning board, workflow management. And when that was no longer usable, we were not really sure we were gonna, where we were gonna go. We wanted to have total control over it. So we sort of went down all the way to the basics and said, we're gonna start not really from scratch, because Django's not scratch, but it's close enough. We're gonna start with this framework, build up our tool set. That happened at, at, at Hubbub, and you know, I'll be very honest with you guys, at the time that we came to Hubbub last year, we were, we were thinking, well, this is a good experience. It's, thanks for the memories, Mike, and you know, we'll see you on the other side. But uh, we had some good discussions with Mike, uh, with Anne Christine, with a bunch of other people in the community, went back and we said, no, 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 but we can, we can harmonize this. We can, we can join these two. Uh, so myself and, and the lead developer, James Foreman, we were driving home and, and, and we, we said, you know, let's, let's think about this idea if we use both same time. Let Hub be really good at what it's good at. Let these really rich and robust forms that we're creating be really good at what they're at, and let's connect them. But we don't want the forms to be embedded in the Hub. We want those forms to sort of be, again, floating, that federated concept. Any application that needs to collect data can use these forms, right? So that's sort of the approach that we took. Um, and so, like I said, that's, to me that's a huge tale of victory, right? So now we're letting people who are using the Hub to collect data but that, the hub is calling the API. So Mike and, and, and Sean and um, Elisa came down uh, to us, which thank you for that, because that was sort of the start of, of our series of hackathons that we've had. We've actually invited a bunch of other vendors down. We've had Plotly in. We created a Plotly plugin for the hub. And that was fantastic. So thank you guys for that. Um, but that really helped get the ball rolling on saying, again, Plotly needs to be a resource for all components of you should take, be able to take Plotly, point it at Grant, point it at the document management system, whatever you want to do. Um, and so the hub is absolutely central now to what we're doing in, in, uh, in ICE, and uh, we're excited to see where you guys are taking the product. As I said before, it's sort of a launch point for almost all of our functionality, so everybody just starts in ICE. Now, we have our ICE logo up in the hub, and people come in, uh, they, they create wikis, they're doing their files, and they're also using it to branch off into grants that to do material intelligence, quality and visualizations. And so for a lot of people, they actually equate ICE with the hub. So they see hub and, hey, it looks like ICE. So uh, we've managed a, a really good degree of transparency there. Um, the project workspaces work really well. Um, and so in general, we're very, very satisfied with the state of the hub in ICE. So <coughs> we had worked on, in, uh, on trying to integrate the files plugin with some of our tool sets and um, as we're unpacking, we're saying, well, we have some tool sets that, we've, that we like that we've used before. Let's try pulling the files plugin out and putting our own CMS or, or DMS, our own document system in there. Um, it gives us the flexibility that we need with a tool set we're very familiar with, right? And I think that this is a big, this is a, a big win for us, but also just a, a bit of, I don't want, maybe a lesson learned for you guys. If you're looking at, at for example, some people may have Alfre Alfresco, and that doesn't need to compete. Again, the thing that we're trying to demonstrate is that you can take the pieces that really work well for you, plug them into the hub, and run with them, right? So if you already have a document system of some kind, plug it in, it works really well, okay? Uh, we're using the CAC integration with OIPC, is actually the, the protocol that we've uh, decided to use. Um, and Kevin actually has a discussion on that this afternoon as well, on how we've implemented OIDC, uh, because having uh, centralized identity management is obviously critical when you have 100, 200 systems talking to each other. Um, and then what we're looking to do is in order to meet that third case that I presented, how you search for data in that Google-like fashion, developing that in interface, uh, and then one area that we haven't really looked at is the tool staging side, and so we're excited for perhaps the next year we'll be coming back uh, and, and talking more about what we've done with that. So as I mentioned before, we really have moved from commercial tool sets to developing and standing up in-house expertise uh, in computer science, data science, statistics, analysis, and it's been very, very positive. Uh, we do look at the hub and its other components as being very complementary, and uh, you know, I was talking to 
the CEO of a company that develops test frames, and he was very concerned about their company trying to develop workflow and, and uh, document management and all this. I'm like, I think that's outside of your core competencies. I think you need to stay focused on what you're good at, and we'll rely on that, and then we're going to put together a tool set, a very rich tool set that works. So a couple of case studies. One is for a group that we work with called the High Temperature Metals Team. Uh, this was actually what prompted us to develop those Django data collection forms that you see here on the right. Um, we used it preliminarily to archive and digitize an enormous catalog of historical data, which included both physical samples, occasionally digital files, and primarily paper. So we had lab notebooks, we had yellow, these things called yellowbacks, got the spines off and scan them, throw them in, attach metadata, and now we're, we're digitized. And now that has been integrated. That was actually the, the first thing that we integrated with the hub when Mike and the team came down with taking these data forms and being able to serve them up through. Um, and rather than using spreadsheets, which they do very commonly to track with what the status is of the research that they're doing, we're building that into our graphical workflow tools, again, serving up these data forms. Um, Jason has a really cool demo on what that graphical tool set looks like. It's very much inspired by tool sets like Lucid Chart, uh, for example, which gives you sort of a canvas that you can drag tools on. It's a bit lightweight, highly, uh, highly usable, so please check that out. Um, and then again, one of the things that we're working on here is you, know, you want these forms not necessarily to point always to the same place. The attachment, which might be your run data going into the document management system, the rest of the form data going to grant or maybe another MySQL or Postgres database. So that's been uh, a very useful, real example of good requirements for us to, to move this project forward. This one, hey, there's the hub. Um, the X-ray diffraction team has really used the hub. Uh, we stood it up, and immediately the next day we saw there was a there were wikis that these people were creating for doing rheology. We, we were very very encouraged to see that um, the hub workspaces really are a great way to handle getting people getting their feet wet and with this concept device. Um, so very well done. And then finally, um, we're working with this organic matrix composites group um, to do process modeling and. What we did is we said, okay, first, they, they, they use a, um, a maker bot to do rapid prototyping, right? So we said, we want to capture the print settings. Well, they can go into the hub and click a button and it'll serve the form. That, that immediately, we had some concerns with that, and I'm sure you guys will identify with this. That, that's not a, a, it contains a contained process in a vacuum. That model that they're printing is based on a solid model that somebody else created, and then they create a variety of different minor tweaks on that solid model. That solid model was inspired by project requirements or some need, some material requirement. So now we have three steps. Defining the material requirement, building your solid model and uploading it and then creating your rapid prototypes. And then once you've created your rapid prototypes, you may take the ones that are successful and do full builds. You're going to uh, characterize them, etc. So this automatically becomes a workflow, which you see there. The notation that we use is a uh, uh, business process modeling notation. Uh, we'll, be looking, we'll be talking a little bit more about that. But we see that we, these aren't self-contained. We need to maintain traceability. So it quickly became one of those things where just throwing up data forms is not the right approach. We need to capture the whole workflow. Again, create a four-step process in the use case I just gave you that says define the requirement, build a solid model, build your rapid prototypes, and then characterize them. And then what we do is we can infer and, and link those things through IDs, and we have full traceability. The picture that you upload for RAP prototype one is linked to the completion of the final panel, right? You can turn that dial all the way back. So I guess here, the takeaway that from this slide is that we would encourage you guys to, to look at this from a, a holistic perspective, from a workflow perspective, and take the time to do it right up front. So a couple of lessons learned. Uh, we've realized there is no one ring to rule them all. I, maybe we're just slow on the uptake and you guys already all know that. But <clears throat> this has been uh, a lesson that is very, very difficult because when you're told to solve this problem, that's the first thing you do. So I get, what can solve my problem? And it's turned out to be a, a, a much bigger effort than just finding that one specific tool set. Uh, and I think that the, the payoff for us has been growing that internal, taking that funding that you would have purchased an expensive commercial solution, using it to staff the right people who can problem solve and develop in-house expertise in these areas. If you're, for example, if you're a, a life sciences lab, getting somebody who can do computer science and data analysis for you would be a huge, huge benefit, okay? 
and don't throw it over the fence and let somebody else solve the problem. And I, I realize that's probably the, one of the biggest things that we suffer with as a DOD, uh, but it's still a good lesson for everyone. Again, and I know I've said this a couple times, but let the tools complement each other. So, I mean, I, like I said, I've got, I'm going to be talking to a couple of you guys probably over lunch. Um, Andy Burnett with that really cool VPC um, and the ability to link people with resources, data inside the hub. That's kind of where we want to take ICE in the future after we get our collection mechanisms together. Very, very exciting things. Those don't need to be competing, they can complement. Uh, the other thing too, I know this is sort of like, again, one-on-one -on -one stuff, but you know, really shoring up the weaknesses and not running from them. Um, you know, when you see, <coughs> in this case, if you're weak in uh, data visualization, get somebody that's good at data visualization, okay? I think that's, it's worth the time to do it. And then as I said before, maintaining open communication. We're gonna push on our end to communicate with you guys more regularly than just once a year, and I think that's a, a really powerful powerful message, because for example, some of you, if you're interested in what we've done with the common service bus, you go to the talk that James is gonna give this afternoon on how to implement that. Our objective is to be able to supply you with the, not just the design, but also at some point the source code for that, that goes for the workflow tools, our document management system, any one of these things. And so uh, we have heard, had great feedback from the community, but like I said, both from commercial uh, folks that we work with, academia, other DOD components, uh, it's a huge deal. And that's the cool part about that service bus, that that, that self-governance lets us take the workflow tools, for example, and pretty easily deploy them in another environment that doesn't have ICE. If you want ICE, great, you can have ICE, but if you just want the workflow management tool set, cool, you can have it. And then finally here is to say, start small, fail fast. Get your product that you're developing in front of your customers very, very quickly. Don't sit and overdevelop it and overanalyze it. Get it out there, get some lessons learned. So for example, our workflow tool set, we're gonna be pushing the alpha out this September. There will be bugs, it's not, it's not perfectly functional yet, but we wanna get that feedback from them. Okay, I did conclusions, lessons learned, same thing. Um, I won't spend too much time here just to say that it's not just a technology problem, it is a culture problem, and that goes for any uh, community of practice. Uh, it doesn't have to be material science engineering. Um, and again, collaboration, collaboration, collaboration. That last bullet point, we want to work with you guys. So how do we do that, right? Can we set up, again, in all seriousness, can we set up a hub for all the hub communities, right, that says, could be like a, Chuck and I were talking during the break. Could be a hub foundation hub or something like that. But we can see you guys, we can set up blogs and wikis for us all to share. Is like the stuff that, that Andy was showing, I'm not just saying Andy was the only one with cool stuff to show, but that, that was some really awesome stuff. I don't want to wait another year to see what all those guys are working on. I'd like to see it as we're all hot off the presses, right? So how can we take advantage of it? So being very open in our communication as a community. Um, yeah, I think that's that one with death. So with that, I'm going to close and I appreciate your time. Questions for Matt? I, I think, by the way, we do have a hub for the hubs. It's hubs, hubzero.org. Uh, but I don't, I don't think we use it well enough. So uh, we probably need to get more groups going and more discussion and things. Uh, but other questions for Matt? Covered it all. Covered it all. It, actually, if you have more questions, uh, there are a bunch of talks this afternoon uh, where they're going to be going over the pieces in more detail. So uh, be sure to check that out. All right. Thanks, Matt. Terrific. Thank